Well, the thing is, is it takes two witnesses uh, in, under common law, whereas a state will accept one witness if he's a notary. But a notary has limited witness authority because all he witnesses is that, that uh, the person is who he, you know, he witnesses the signature or he witnesses that he, he takes an oath by somebody saying that, yeah, such and such is true. And so he can do that. And he can also certify powers of attorney, copies of it. Well, yeah, but you can also do notary presentment, let's say. If you can do presentment, right? You can do denial, right? Or acceptance, or, yeah. or, or so there are limited design. functions, but that's not being an officer of court. That's doing a function, a state function. Right. But you're in the executive branch on that one, see. Uh -huh. So, but if you're actually in court doing some court function, well, yeah, then you're an officer. Uh -huh. Well, you remember, you got to remember what. Don't get don't get uh, enthralled by the idea of what an officer of the court is. Because one of the officers of the court back in the old days was called the court jester. Okay? He was an officer of the court, and his responsibility was entertainment. I've been thinking of hiring one for my court. Uh, I know a lady uh, who had uh, some uh, criminal charges as uh, a teenager, mm -hmm. and she, it took her a, a, a little over a year to get her notary. But she did get it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, getting arrested doesn't necessarily, or, or you know, getting charges. What they want to know is, are you trustworthy? <coughs> That's what it boils down to, you know. If, there's, if you have a record of, uh, of moral turpitude, yeah, they don't want you. But, you know, if you just, they're not going to get mad at you for having traffic tickets or maybe you stole something when you were a teenager. You know, they, they, they're pretty forgiving along, along those lines. Yeah. Is there such a thing as a common law notary? <clears throat> I don't know. I guess, yeah. I guess, yeah. Notary was, is an ancient, uh, an ancient position. I know two people that have common law notary stamps. Yeah. Well, I've got to check it out. You know. Yeah. But I'll, I'm going to check it out. But you have to, you have to understand that if you're in the legal stuff, uh, there's nothing better than being a sovereign. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Well, let's see. It's, uh, Jim, we were supposed to start eating at 5. It's 5.30. We're late. You want to quit till 6.30? Sure. Yes. All right. That time goes by fast when you're done <laughs> Yeah, it is. And when we come back, what we'll take up on is uh, the general motions and orders. Okay, 33, 372. <laughs> Go? I guess that's what that meant. Anyway, I was down here this morning. I was trying to encourage uh, you people to pay kind of a special attention to Thornton. He has kind of a different style of message. If we get the uh, our common law back... Oh, by the way, I'm Rotten Run, for those of you that don't know. Oh, yeah. I fired everybody on the public payroll. And when I got to prison, the guy said, man, you're rotten. So they started calling me Rotten Run. I said, well, I think I like that. So it's uh, kind of stuck with me. Well, anyway, on this message that Bill's teaching, if we ever get our common law back, which is what... He has kind of a different attitude. It's never gone anywhere. But if we that are out here struggling to find America get it back, you're looking at Resurrection Day today. I mean, we currently have a lot of people doing time, right? Mental institutions and prisons. Never an injured party. We have instances where there's not even trials going on. So, this message that Bill's teaching, he's been trying to make me understand it for 20 years. I'm starting to catch on. I hope it don't take you that long. I hope the efforts that we're putting out right now are going to be encouraging for the rest of you because in a few months we ought to have a very interesting story to tell trying to get one party that's currently being held in a mental institution Soviet Union style no trial not one word of testimony and three years just do three years in the mental institution and then when you get out, the phony charges that we've got against you, well, I will bring them to light. 
And and the, probably the long and short of it is, before they're done with the prison and all of that nonsense, they'll probably be deporting this lady. Well, anyway, the common law has become extremely important to me at this point in time in my life. And if it's successful, you will never probably need any other style of... Well, I don't want to say that, because I would imagine when this lady's out, we're going to be somewhere in a Title 42 or a, a RICO action on 28 people that have tried to ruin someone's life. So you've all been there, and you've all heard all of the speakers and all of the wonderful things the wonderful things all these years I've been telling people you read about a case where the Supreme Court says you guys can't do that you turn around and try and do that it don't work for you you know there's only one thing that nobody's ever done and that's gone back and investigated the structure of the individual who was he what clubs did he belong to had he done his UCC was he in control of his straw man? Who, do, who knows? Did they just throw out a, <coughs> a tidbit to drag us in? Well, this message that Bill is teaching is going to teach a lot of government people a lesson that they, they can bow out if they want. But I'm sure they'll opt not to. But there's just too much of this going on. Too many people... I've been at it for over... I started in October 1973. I was actually upset a lot sooner than that, but it took me a while to find that there was other people that cared. In September of 1973, I probably had more guns and ammunition than the whole gang here put together. And on my vacation, I just started shooting off my ammo. And my kids said, Well, Dad, do you want us to pick up the the brass because I used to have it reloaded all the time I said hell no forget about it I ain't going to win this thing by myself and nobody gives a crap the next month I ran into the Orange County people I got involved with an outfit called Tax Action Council back in 1973 and boy I'll tell you what a trip I've been on ever since <laughs> well I'll tell you though I've been looking for America can't find it it's ever going to be resurrected. Bill's got the only message that's going to do it. Now maybe after, and we know that there are uh, somewhere in this country judges that will chastise unruly servants. It's a damn shame it all has to be done right. But it's just like the poor lady that's in right now. I don't care how stupid you are. If they don't have jurisdiction, ignorance is not going to be their excuse to move ahead. So we should be able to help other people as this process continues and continues to develop. So listen up very carefully to Bill, my dear friend. Well, it's too late. They've already had a chance to ignore me. <laughs> well, are you telling them anything worth a damn, Bill? I mean, it, it, took, it took him a long time to get it pounded into my head what he was doing. So I hope it don't take that long with you people. And it looks like he's got a lot better tools than when he used to work with me. Okay, Bill, it's all yours. Thank you. It's all yours, people. How the hell? There you go. Thank you. Appreciate that, Ron. Ron's kind of a... Yeah, Rotten Ron is a kind of a hidden entity here. Tell you a little bit about Ron. He got arrested one time something to do with income tax as I recall and uh, <clears throat> spent a year in the Gray Bar Hotel I think it was a year wasn't it one year well it, they gave me a year yeah I, even that was interesting the judge says I sentenced you to one year and I said well I want a year and a day because I talked to guys that were already in prison if you get a year that's not even considered a sentence you get a year and a day, you get furloughs and weekends and stuff like that. I said, give me a year and a day. He <laughs> gave me a year and a day. I got two furloughs while I was there for a week. Yeah. <laughs> and, but then when they put him on probation, he said, screw you. He didn't want probation. So he had to force him out the door. And then and he told me, he says, you tell me 
where to be on what day and I'll be there otherwise I'm not going to screw you guys okay so all you did is you put me, you you put me in jail because the crime I committed was that I worked for a living <laughs> okay <laughs> I mean, he, he pulled no punches with his judge he says yeah, and so then when he gets out of jail he wouldn't he wouldn't talk to the uh, uh, probation officer he didn't want anything to do with him and he told him in advance he wasn't going to okay so they, this guy, they couldn't do anything with. He went to where he'd say on the, the certain day, whatever it was, and they never showed up. Okay. But uh, Ron is, has, uh, ha- has quite a, a history of, quote, commitment behind him. He got committed, which proved his commitment to them, and they decided they didn't want to mess with him anymore. So, By the way, I wasn't in a, 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 a common law court or a Nisi Prius court or what was it Nisi Prius? I don't know. It's an unknown court, whatever it was, like uh, the tax court or something. I don't know. Whatever it was, but they got you. Tax <coughs> and then, and of course, while he's in there, he's doing what all of you should do when you go in, and that's educate the other prisoners. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's an opportunity to to. to uh, administer to other people that's exactly right and then you you give them ideas and they go in the court and they raise hell and they're still in jail and what they're raising hell you know and and there was this it's kind of funny and you know over in the Philippines the Japanese took over the Philippines for a while and they had this deal where apparently some of the Filipinos were not happy about being taken over and so they'd go out and they'd stir up trouble with the Japanese well the Japanese decided well the thing to do is to kill them which they did okay but the problem was is that every time they killed one of these Filipinos there were he knew two or three people that were sort of uh, you know upset but neutral and then that pissed them off you know and the next thing you know they were out there stirred up trouble every time they killed one guy they created three and the problem just grew and grew and grew and too many Japanese were getting killed and they had to back out, you know. They couldn't, and uh, here's what we have. Look at all you sitting there, all right, and myself included. Why are we where we are? Because we have friends who got hurt out of this deal, right? So every time they hurt one of they don't seem to understand. It's interesting, government understands one thing. If you got a problem, you beat somebody up to solve it, okay? And so when they beat somebody up, they create more. Now, I remember back in 19, um, well, let's say, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, something like that, 20 years ago, the, uh, the feds figured out that there were something like a thousand died in the wool, absolute, no holds barred, people who would not pay the taxes under any circumstances would go to jail, okay? This was at their own research showed them. Of course, that means there's a lot of people who are less committed. So, five years later, they did another survey. They found there were 5,000 people out there that wouldn't. That's what their own research showed them. They didn't catch on. They don't understand what the problem is. And also, another time, I got an email from this researcher who worked for one of these think tanks. And she was concerned about the militias. That was her job to analyze and so forth. And she was commenting <clears throat> that, try as they might, they couldn't find where the centralized, where this was coming from. Here these people all over the country are, are forming these militias, they're doing these things, and they just know that there is some central source that's influencing all these people to come up against the government. Okay? <clears throat> so I wrote a letter back to her. And I said, the reason you can't find these people is because, the, you know, the central source, they don't exist. Okay? I said, what you're observing is that there is a central source of abuse of the people <laughs> called Washington, D.C. And what's happening is that you're seeing a general reaction rising up against the abuses of this centralized source of misbehavior. She wrote a letter back to me thanking me for this. You know, she says, I never thought of that. And I'm going to look into that further. (laughs) You know, in all her research and so forth, it never occurred to them this concept. 
Well, I never heard from her again, but it was interesting that here they were in the, the think tank. They had never occurred to them, maybe it's us. You know, we're it never the, occurred to them that the people in Iraq are trying to defend that country against an invasion. Oh, no, no, those are terrorists and insurgents. Yes, that's right. You, you get with the program. <laughs> <laughs> Bush is not going to approve of you. <laughs> Wasn't it changed when it said by, arose by any of our names? Yeah. <laughs> well, I hadn't, heard that, hadn't heard that version, but okay. Anyhow, Ron has some credits for several years. He sponsored, he paid the rent out of his own pocket. He had a couple of uh, uh, somewhat helpful partners, but for several years he sponsored a, a meeting place, actually rented office space, had copy machines for people who were running their cases and everything. He's been quite an asset to people like us. And so he's got a remarkable record of, of uh, supporting, putting his money where his mouth is. So uh, that's why when, when Ron felt like he wanted to contribute a few words to this thing, I said, sure, great, because Ron is really, uh, really has a history of, of being a good guy. So there you are. Thank you, Ron. Hey, yeah. Don't let that get out. Don't let that get out, he says. All right. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm ruining his reputation right now. But hey, you know. <clears throat> but you know, let's look. Uh, I want to reiterate. Why, why are we doing what we're doing? And I feel that, the, that what is on those name tags is our real... That's, that should be our theme right there. We're here to encourage, because we can't guarantee it, but we're here to encourage the government to obey the law. If they would obey the law as intended by the Constitution, as intended by many other sources and philosophies and so on, uh, this place would be a lot better. And, uh, and so I'm not... Look, I'm one of the owners of the system. I'm one of the people. And everybody else who claims he's a people is one of the owners of the system. And... <clears throat> I'm not against the system. I'm quite the opposite. I want the system to work. Yes, I recognize there are certain controls. I mean, you know that you've met people yourself who you give them half a chance and they'll take advantage of you, cheat you, or whatever. And yet, if you have reasonable controls, they tend to stay more or less in line. And so, I recognize we have some need for control, but there's a big difference between setting up a system of common rules that everybody can appreciate and understand and the difference between that and using the rules to attack your political enemies or to somehow create a new prison industry or various things like that, see? So if we have real genuine obeying of the law, we will have real genuine freedom, okay? That, so that's my position. I'm not, in, I'm not, you know, there was a meeting very similar to this one in Las Vegas about a month ago. Now, if you speak English and you really understand English words, you're going to be startled by this. During the meeting, it was people who were interested in, you know, protecting their rights and this sort of thing. One of the leaders of the meeting got up and he said, uh, how many of you are insurrectionists? And about half of them said, yay! Do you know what an insurrectionist is? Any idea? An insurrectionist is somebody who believes in rebellion by force. Let's get our guns and so forth. That's what they believe. I'll tell you, you don't want to be an insurrectionist. That's not our purpose. I own the system. I don't want people rebelling against me. I want that system to work. It's a good system, but it's being abused. And it's, it appears like that the, there's enough organization with black budgets and this sort of thing. And are you all familiar with black budgets, right? No. <clears throat> black budgets, that's money that Congress awarded that can, does not have to be accounted for. Okay? Black budget runs into multi-millions or billions of dollars. <clears throat> so, it's uh, black budget companies or organizations, uh, when they set up telephone lines, they have what they call hello lines. Okay? That means when somebody calls the number, they answer hello. If you don't know why you're calling that number, you're not going to get anywhere on those lines. You can never find out who owns the line or anything like that. By the way, 
I have an article about that on that CD or on my website. It's there. Article in uh, Scientific American. You're familiar with that publication, right? Uh, Scientific American had an article a few years back, which I've, I've uh, repeated on the website and on the CD, where it, it's officially okay for the government to lie. Okay? <clears throat> officially okay for the government to lie. Okay? On these black budget programs. All right? So, <clears throat> there's a problem there because secrecy always leads to abuse. Again, um, I'm not against the government. I'm against the abuse. Okay? And, that, and, and when I encourage the government to obey the law, I'm going to do it through the courts. And that should be our theme. When you, if you adopt an attitude like that, it's going to be very, very difficult to, to, for the government to come against you because what can be more obvious than obeying the law? Advocating obeying the law. How can they, you know, it's, it, it's, a lot of times it's not so much important what you say as it is how you say it. Okay? So, you got to say, get the right terms. Well, I have the terms of peace. Okay? The terms of law, order. Hey, there's a good theme, law and order, right? <clears throat> it's a popular theme. Hey, we ought to pick up on that. That's what we want, law and order. But what kind of order? We don't mean the kind of order where agent provocateurs go in and beat up people to start a fight so that now they can arrest them. You know, that, that's kind of considered unfair. And, uh, oh yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's their theme. You know, they found out it, it's a formula that works. But until we become aware of it. All right, I want to mention a couple of things. We had some conversation on the side during the break. And I'd just like to bring this to your attention. This is not part of our original deal, but it's important enough for you to realize because some of you people are in the midst of the battle, okay? And there's a couple of things you need to watch out for. One of them is a demur. Anybody know what a demur is? Yes. <clears throat> what is it? It means so what? No. No. Not at all. Not at all. What's your authority? <clears throat> it's an agreement of the facts. That's closer. That's better. The demur, basically, when you, when you get sued and you answer that lawsuit with a, uh, a defensive kind of answer, Okay, in your defensive answer, you, you will answer on a number of grounds. One of them is they have the facts wrong, so you challenge the facts. They can have the law wrong, so you challenge the law. And so then you, you get basically go to trial. In common law, there's a hierarchy of, of papers. You first have the action that takes place, the original lawsuit. Then you have the answer. Then you have the reply to the answer. And then you have the reply to the reply. And then the terms get technical. I can't remember what it's called. But it goes back and forth. And each time that a, an, a response comes through, the response must be limited to whatever the issues were before and less. Because you're supposed to narrow down these issues. You can't go outside. So you have the initial lawsuit. You got your initial wide open response. After those first two, the reply to the answer must stay within the issues raised in the answer. And then, yeah, you've got to stay on point. And then the, re then the, the response to the, that reply has to deal with what's on that reply. So it automatically comes down to there. At some point, you're ready to go to trial. And that, what, does somebody remember what that's called when you're ready to go? I keep forgetting the name of that paper that you file that says you're ready, the, that the, the issues are ready for adjudication. Nobody remembers it? No, not, that's a conference. I'm talking about a paper you file. What's this paper you file that says you're ready? Anyway, there is one, okay? There's a judicial council form you fill out. Huh? No, it's just a, a single sheet of paper says you're ready. It's like a request for... Well, no, it, it's just, you're ready. You're, you're, there's no more issues to be discussed. It's a single sheet of paper. It's just, yeah, an at-issue memorandum. That's what it's called. Right. An at-issue, two words, at-issue memorandum. That's the, that's the one. So when one of you is ready, you're not going to answer anymore, you're at-issue. That means you're ready to be adjudicated, all right? Now, that's the common law procedure. In the 
equity procedure, they limit it to three papers. <laughs> Accusation, answer, reply to the answer. It's in common law where you have this longer list. Whether you're talking about equity or you're talking about common law, either way, there is a, a um, maneuver, a paper you can file called a demur. So at some point, you're going back and forth, and then you call, somebody puts in a demur. The demur is a challenge based only on law. When you file a demur, or when the other side files a demur, whoever files a demur is stating in his demur, whether he states it openly or not, makes no difference. He's saying, I got, a, I got an issue about law, but I agree to all the facts. So don't file a demur if you haven't dis something about facts that you don't like, okay? If they've made up bad facts. Right. So you must always remember a demur is automatic agreement to all the facts. Okay? Now this is great. Yes, sir? Can you uh, reserve issues uh, of fact that you're questioning? No, if you, have, you, if you have a reservation of issues, then file an answer, a response or something, and attack it. So you have it. to deal with, you cannot put, combine the two, you have to get rid of all Yeah, you do combine the two in an answer, but if you're just doing a demur, you've, you've cut out half of it. You've said, well, the facts are okay, I'm just talking about law. If you want to talk about l both law and facts, then continue responding to the paperwork. That's, that's similar to going for a summary <coughs> judgment. You now want no, to no. Well, that well, okay. Ahead, Summary judgment does not exist at common law except in one place, and that's where there's a contempt of court. There is no summary judgment otherwise. Yes, sir. Yeah, is uh, I'd heard somewhere that uh, if uh, they come back with a uh, response of uh, failure to state a claim without you know, uh, on which relief can be granted. Well, they can make a motion, sure. Yeah, but they are when they do that, they have stipulated to the facts. Well, it's like, I guess it's a demur, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, it, it's a demur in, dis in disguise, yes. In small claims court, I won a case by using the word demur. Okay, you, you want to... Uh, yeah, well, I didn't say you can't win. I just said you're agreeing to the facts. Well, what I did... Well, not exactly. Uh, when I... Uh, uh, you got the microphone here? I was a... Here it is. So microphone phone coming up. I All right. Now, wait a minute. Start at the beginning. You, you were in small in claims. Small claims court. I won a case. Uh, using the word demur. Um, I was the plaintiff. There was a defendant. Defendant starts uh, testifying that the contract said this and that. And I objected. And the judge said, um, uh, based on demur, he says, you, the, the judge said, you should sure use large words. Are you an attorney? I says, your honor. Where are the facts? So he turned around to this person and mm -hmm. asked, where is the contract? Mm -hmm. Well, there was no contract. She was yeah. saying there was. Well, then that was not a demur. Well, it probably wasn't, but it worked. And, he, oh, okay. and okay. she blew it, and I won the case. Well, you've got to remember that in form you were incorrect, but in substance you were correct. You yeah. So that's what he looked at was the substance. Right. Remember that, that substance trumps form. And so, even if you called it a demur, just based on what you told me, you were still dealing with facts. You said the facts were incorrect. Right. So, you know, it's the same thing in your paperwork. Your paperwork, you have all these titles and so forth. You can misname it, but what does the body say? And so, you, you attack the facts even though you called it a demur. That's right. And when, and when you asked you if you were an attorney and you said no and you were talking well, about I this other stuff... No. I didn't answer. Well, the thing is, is that it was obvious you weren't because an attorney wouldn't have made that mistake. No, I just over... I just... Got rid of that yeah. and said, "Your Honor, where are the facts?" And yeah, that's it. That's it. That was the that was the substance. That was a substan substantive claim. Well, see, the thing is, though, is you agree the facts. Now, here's what happens: a lot of times, you file something and the attorneys come back with a demur. So here's what I do: I come back. My response to the demur is, is that I agree. Yes, he's right. Yes, he's right. Yes, he's right. So delete all those from my claim. What's left is just the facts that he agreed to and this law that he, that he missed. And now I move for summary judgment based on that. And he automatically loses because he agreed to all the facts. Okay? <laughs> I take out all the conflicting things as long as I have enough left to hang them on. Okay? It's a great technique. 
Now, let me explain summary judgment. Summary judgment, it's another motion, okay? You know about motions. All right, summary judgment is a motion 